la vérité touche au réel. Young Zizekians have assembled. We have a very special guest. We have a special guest with us. Brian Becker, Dr. Tom McGowan himself, the inimitable Russell Spriglia, Isabel Millar, engaging in conscious. In the imaginary domain, we have an intersubjective dialectic. Vanishing mediators. What is going on, everybody? It is your favorite, not one, the not two, Vanishing Mediators. Back at it again with another banger. We've been gone for a while. We've kind of taken a little hiatus to uh, work on some academic projects and just study like usual. So sorry for the wait, y'all, as little Wayne says. So we're back at it again. What are we going over, Nick? Today we are going to go over lecture 20 of the seminar of Jacques Lacan. That is number two. And objectified analysis is currently in our crosshairs. Right. I know that, Andrew, you have studied this chapter more exhaustively than I, but we both have some contributions to make. Yeah, definitely. We'll go through this one. He's and gonna what would you like to tell us to start well, us off? Well he's gonna reiterate a lot of concepts that we're familiar with like reconnaissance, uh specular image, um, which is the ego, uh the Urbild, whatever I think it's a German term, which uh he's he's used a lot even in seminar one, and I don't think we really touched on it. But really what it means is like your uh, fundamental image, like almost like it kind of translates into like archetype, but it's like not in the same way of, of like a Jungian archetype, pretty much like it is the specular image in the mirror stage essay. Uh, we could kind of refer to it as the ideal ego. So there's like an idealized image that is maintained within the specular ego and its misapprehensions, its uh, misrecognition of itself uh that's kind of foundational before we get into like the other aspect of the ego which is the ego ideal um, i wonder if it means if it comes from build this is just me speculating but there are enough cognate words between english and german right. and i think i could make an build, guess build, doom. build but like to build and then er as in all something overarching because i know we have an ur text, yes, a fundamental text that underlies other texts, and then you have ur stoff is a German phrase I've heard to describe matter, pri primary yeah. matter. So I'm thinking it's like the build, the built, yeah, of and all things. Uh, that yeah, it's like I like the way you. I like the way you put that. And definitely that was kind of like what I was going to add on as soon as you mentioned build. Uh, one of the concepts in Hegel, um, which I even think Heidegger will kind of sometimes echo it, the Bildung, which has to deal with learning and education. And he kind of talks about, he, him and as, as in Hegel, talks about like architecture and like form and like the realization of, of being or whatever. Now I'm not like, huge into the aesthetic aspect of Hegel, with Bill Doom and learning has to do with like the, the pretty much the artifice of, of an image. And uh, I think even relates that with religion. So we could even see like building as in uh, a creating an image and learning as more of a negative aspect for psychoanalysis in which it's a, not an actual learning of something positive, but actually like a misrecognition, like an error. And then a Bill Dung's Roman is a coming of age story exactly yeah right no that's it that's perfect uh the, the youth building him yeah herself and and so yeah. with with this chapter though it's like the main thing that we're talking about is uh this guy named fairbairn who is uh, a scottish psychoanalyst uh in the school of uh object relations so the main premise of this lecture is to analyze one of his works um that was in a volume of the International Journal of Psychoanalysis, volume 25, 
It's entitled uh, Endopsychic Structure, uh, considered in terms of object relationships. So this one is going to be very clinical heavy or cl clinical jargon compared to what we've been used to for a handful of seminars because we've been dealing with more of the conceptual theoretical stuff of not only Lacanian jargon, but uh, Freud and just kind of more of a philosophical safe haven. And now we got to get into the clinical stuff. So that's what makes this one kind of a little tricky if you're not used to um, that jargon. Let's also remember the lecture that this one is on the heels of, which is the lecture about schema L, the yeah. wall of language and the specular ego. Yeah. So maybe the placement of this lecture after that one has something to do with trying to, as we've been focused on from the start of this seminar, reorient us as to what the ego is. Yeah. This question might have gotten lost in the past few lectures. So now he's doing a very Lacanian maneuver here by latching his own sort of cross-examination of yeah. the ego to another thinker's misapprehensions, misunderstandings yeah. of the ego, misunderstandings of Freud, so that he can salvage what he sees as the real core of the ego, which is what we've talked about before, the ideational mass, and bring it back to language and specularity. Exactly, because because that's what he wants to remind us, is that this specular image, it's an alienation. And so one of the things that he is critiquing in Fairburn, but that he also sees in a lot of schools in, of psychoanalysis that want to diverge from Freud and uh, create their own authentic system is this like impulse of objectivation, objectification of like, oh, we got to be more critical. We got to be more scientific. But he says uh, like the objectivation of psychoanalysis always results in the remodeling of the ego on the model of the analyst ego. Because if the ego is a central thing for these analysts, well, what ego are we talking about then? A healthy ego? Well, we're going to rely on the analyst setting the standard as what an ego ought to be because for them the ego is given but what what where did they get this notion of ego from if not resorting to the empirical data of what modern psychology or the current uh milieu of psychology is doing they're on a different mode but you know one thing that's not in question is uh whatever it is they're investigating. It's like they're talking about a mind, but they treat the mind as like a center, a substance of some sort, even if they don't use that terminology, it's like this presupposition. And so the analysts of these object relations, relational ego psychology, they're all falling into the same dogmatic presuppositions of taking things as given based upon an empirical or observational analysis. Lacan is like, no, the ego is an alienation. And He's not resorting to topographies to confuse the subject with the ego. He's using thoughts, thought experiments like the optical schema to show like the phenomenon of the ego is a specular that alienates the subject. And we get caught in this imaginary narcissistic relationship. Right. And if you think about it, it's like the ego for Lacan is something of a waste product created by this specular process. And the ego is initially, if I understand it, either a kind of pleasure ego is how it's described at one point. At another point here, the or build, an original image, which I guess never really comes to fruition. It's never truly an or build in the sense that all of the parts are coherent no there's a alienation yeah that is coterminous with the experience of this original or build but here's what's interesting we talk about this dialectic of the ideal ego as you just mentioned the ideal ego is in a sense a kind of 
projection that we can locate as coming from this original specular experience. And then we have the ego ideal, of course, which is more of an anticipatory, symbolic mm -hmm. ego shaping itself on the horizon. But the ego itself is more, I would say, within the frame of the pleasure principle. The in the sense that the ego itself is what through a kind of edipalization or adaptation to the symbolic order must conform to certain social norms, must yeah. conform to social expectations. And this is the exact sort of mass of identifications upon which the work of analysis should be exercised. Yeah. What that means is that it's not like, oh, okay, let's find out what this patient's ideal ego is or ego ideal, or let's try to caricature that in some sense or char uh, characterize right. that, I, that ego ideal so that they can you know, uh, divest themselves of it, right? Unburden themselves of it, but that's not really it because the ego itself is neither the ideal ego nor the ego ideal. Would you agree with any of that? Would you disagree? I, will, I would say that the ego, yeah. Well, the ego is it is this like constant affirmation and negation, um, but it has a hard time situating itself in either or because of this tension and. Uh, I want to just elaborate on what you're saying with something that was really helpful reading the uh, first chapter of Subjectivity and Otherness by uh, Lorenzo Chiesa. Uh, his whole first chapter on the imaginary and the imaginary other, it's like, well, what the ego and what we see in seminar two uh, being iterated when he says, don't use these terms as mouthwash, is that, yeah, the ego is an other. So it's like the ego is not itself, but like it is a specular image, but it needs the other to to kind of uh ground its libidinal investment because well what is what is being alienated but the subject right and if we're still stuck on these early seminars which we have to reread freud we have to understand these terms like libido because for libido it's pretty much something that all animals and and us all like species have but what makes us different is that we go back to the mirror stage essay and even something that Freud talks about in Instincts and the Resistitudes and, and other scientific essays, that we're prematurely born compared to animals. So, like, you know, we we somehow rely on, on this specular lure, as he'll say in seminar one, uh, compared to animals. The animals, they only need it for mating, but we maintain it because of a certain lack or crack in, in us, like this excess of libido. And so, yeah, I would agree that there is this sort of pleasure seeking aspect of the object of satisfaction of the libido, especially uh, narcissism, the narcissism essay shows that the final sexual object or the object that the libido aims at is the ego. It is this narcissistic dialectic. One thing that maintains this tension, though, is something that I was explaining to you offline that I, it kind of like slipped out of our our periphery like when we were talking about the, these seminars is uh his play of words uh enamoration which yeah. is love hate it's the constant tension of imaginary jouissance not only on the specular image but on as you were saying the anticipation of what the ego ideal is if not uh imaginary symbolic enmeshment of what the other wants and what you want from the other this is what yeah. we have to also recognize like the master slave dialectic in, but in this aspect i think my point was not that the ego is pleasure seeking no. in line with the, the you know the dictates of the pleasure principle so much as wouldn't you say that the ego is situated where at the the deadlock of this sort of negation, affirmation, the deadlock of this dialectic, uh, which is driven by the libido, 
um, is also constrained by certain social forces in a sense. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't saying this kind of, I I just want to clarify what I meant there in terms of just like, it's not, we're we're not just driven by self-preservation and the desire to uh, satisfy basic needs, but the the ego uh, is uncertainly framed and coordinated by these opposing vying forces um, because we see it within the frame of the pleasure principle because we live in a society of yeah. the pleasure principle, although that is not right. What we are, we are right. No, yeah, no, I knew what you I meant. Don't know yeah. If that's at all, and, true, but I don't want to get us too sidetracked. And anyway. the last thing to, to say, to kind of quote that is that like, yeah, there, there is this like, uh, there, there are these pressures or anticipations. We got imaginary anticipation, and then we got the logical time of anticipation of the other, the gaze or or the look, uh, the, the the moment of understanding, the moment of concluding, uh, constantly being pressed upon us in the symbolic order to deduce who we are, and and sometimes you know the ego fails to do that, the ego in its imaginary relation, um, but. Yeah, I get exactly what you're saying. I don't know if that makes sense, though. I don't know if what I was saying totally makes sense either, but when we're talking about the ego, he doesn't talk very much in this seminar about the ideal ego or the ego ideal. I notice he's interested in the ego. Yeah. Which the ego ideal would be maybe of all of these identifications, the one that's the most symbolically charged. And then the ideal ego is kind of, in a sense, a mythical moment. Exactly. Um, Yeah. It's it's, a non-alienated union with the the self, but even at the heart of that is a master-slave dialectic. Then... But the ego par excellence, the symptom par excellence, the ego that analysis is working on is an ego that is located at certain social right. intersections, I would say. And and so for this chapter, like, you know, Freud, Freud wasn't necessarily clear on, and he didn't go far enough to elaborate on the difference between uh ideal ego and ego ideal and you're right there's not too much of of emphasis of those two terms in this seminar as it were in seminar one but the way i take it is that the urbild is in a sense another way of describing um what the ideal ego is and the way i always like to think about it is like when we look at the the mirror stage essay that is ideal ego and he even talks about it as an ideal imago um and then we could see as you were saying this symbolically charged Ego is the ego ideal because there is this uh, intertwined aspect between um, the imaginary and the symbolic. The ego ideal couldn't exist without one thing that he mentions in here in this essay as we'll kind of go on is something that these object relationists don't account for is the intersubjective relationship. And that's where we get an ego ideal from. So fair Baron, however you say it, where does he go wrong? So, right. So uh, when we look at this essay um, about, uh, what is it? The endopsychic structure in terms of object relations, right? He's one of these people that wants to remodel Freud's work, all right? And uh, he wants to reorient the ego in object relations. So what that means is that he thinks that the ego seeks an object that this ego, yes, it's going to be a center. He's going to have this true notion of ego, but the ego is always in relation to an object. And an object is just like one of these terms that just like doesn't get criticized by them. It's like they take it as given or it's like, you know, oh, it's just something out there that the ego strives for, you know. And um, for him, though, the, the, the object first starts with the mother 
the mother's breast as we get into like the OG of object relations, which is Klein, and then you get um, Winnicott. And so he's kind of along the, the lines of, of these people and seeing that, well, the baby, the, it gets a sense of objects between uh, the mother's nurturing and anything that goes wrong with its relation in the mother will then you get this sort of schism of object and you get what's called a good object and a bad object. And so that splits the ego. Um, and one of the main things though that Lacan stresses is that, well, uh, we could see the model that, or this top topology that Fairbairn is working with in his understanding of the psychic uh, structure as nothing more than an imaginary economy, right? So so what this makes me think of is the essay that I think you might have read parts of it or listened to Alenka's lecture. We talk about it a lot, and it's it's one of Alenka's uh, hobby horses, I guess you could call it, which is for Nainung. Mm -hmm. And what's really fascinating about her very meticulous um, examination of this short essay of Freud's on negation is not just because it has consequences for this one, I guess we could call it semi unconscious reaction that people might exhibit in analysis, but also because it really bears upon the exact structure of the unconscious the ego and the subject in that what you're talking about right there this idea of the schism or skits between good and bad object that might seem at first first blush to be a a very sophisticated approach to the object of the libido but here's the issue there's some truth to it but yeah. when the patient says that is i don't know who that woman in my dream was but that is not my mother the point is not that oh well it is your mother aha case closed you're just too afraid to approach it yeah. there is a fear of approaching something but it's and there is a kind of schism but the schism is between not between good mother bad mother and it's not even between mother and and not mother that's not so important, although we're getting closer once we try to, in some sense, draw a line of division between mother and not mother. But that line of division, which remains invisible, is the kind of object. If there is an object, that would be more of the libidinal object. And what and I would bring this back to we were saying about affirmation and negation that with the idea of this, the pleasure ego, I don't want to guess too far afield, but with the idea of the pleasure ego is that once the subject is, let's say, we don't want to say fully integrated, but unsurely integrated into the symbolic order and aspiring towards an ego ideal the retracing of his steps which is going to follow this divided line mm -hmm. becomes the the aim in a sense not yeah. just to get back to a, a womb like edenic reality but to also understand oh well this line divides what is was once you know because originally it's like okay you have negation affirmation you take in what's good you interject what's good that is me i identify with what's good and i spit out what's bad because you are lukewarm i spit you out right it's like yeah. i spit out what's bad but eventually a dividing line needs to be imposed between umwelt and innenwelt between the yeah. outside and the inside so what becomes a source of frustration is the fact that that line was drawn up that divides the right. two. And then I can't find where that line is because it's not a real line in a sense. Exactly. 
Right. But right. I do have an outside intuition of me and an inside intuition of of me. And I do operate as if there is this fundamental distinction. And that becomes a kind of point of frustration. So that's the real skits, as I understand. Exactly. It. It, exactly. It, because the, the main thing, as you pointed out, and building up from your starting point, which was Vernina, well, we're dealing with language. And one of the things that was that I was thinking about that's really helpful is when in Brian Becker's series of seminar one, I forget which one it is, but he talks about um, like when you look at a uh, classified document from the government, like you'll see how like some words are present and the other words are blotched out by black ink. It's almost like that's how the structure of language is um uh, you know, when we are admitted into the symbolic order, not all of the prohibitions of the father or the no of the father is fully articulated and signifiers. And so you have a lot of gaps, glitches, glitches and absences. So when it comes to Renayanung, right, it's not like, oh, aha, you were thinking about your mother. Well, it's like, well, mother and other somehow uh, take act as placeholders or substitutes for a metaphor for the, the subject, right? Because we're dealing with the subject and not the ego or this object relation. And it's it, it becomes really cliche when the object relations bro is like, oh, you really were thinking about your mother, you know, let's take it back. And, you know, it's really these people, not Freud or Lacan that are trying to triangulate us in this mommy, daddy, me, you know, Oedipal. That's a good point. Drama, drama that like, you know, they Del give us a bad rap. Yeah, you know, Deleuze and Guattari imagine. Um, but yeah, like the, the schism, if there is one, it's it, that is frustrating is from this distinction between the in and envelope and unwell. And one thing that you, that is, it's, it's, it is, it is true. There is this frustration. Lacan points this out in the imaginary thing, but it has nothing to do with, with objects. But the fact that it has everything to do with our uh, mere recognition with the other, that's what right. is at stake. And there is no other in this uh, this this schema that Fairbairn or Fairbairn's theoretical model it has everything to do with the object. So it's like, well, what is the relationship between the object and the mother? If the mother is the one that's supposed to be, you know, uh, bringing about this object relation primarily for this for this uh, baby, well, what is her symbolic, you know, situation? Of course, he's going to elaborate that in seminar four when we talk right. about the relation of an object with the symbolic order. We get like frustration, privation, you know, lack or castration. Yeah, I wasn't using frustration exactly in that sense, but I think it does fit there because it's frustration still is more like imaginary. Castration is almost the acceptance of frustration right. in a sense where frustration is almost channeled into the symbolic and then in a sense that you could say almost becomes what um serves as the 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 actual network itself yes. of like what travels the network itself of the symbolic is it is this kind of frustration but more like in a in a more fixed way but there are a few things come to mind i don't know if that i don't know if I, what i said just made that much well, no like, and, and you're right of using frustration because fairbairn points out in his essay that you know even though like he'll say that an object is just this mass which lacan will uh reiterate like there's really no critical understanding of what an object is he'll then say well an object is either a frustrating object or a non-frustrating object okay. yeah so right that's well, the whole presupposition of object relations how could i try to both of us maybe try to bring this a little bit back down the earth and talk about i don't know the experience of the child although there are always uh many pitfalls when trying to bring things back to a kind of like developmental psychological approach but just for the sake of illustrating what we're talking about if you think about let's say a child who a a baby only knows this process of I like this, I don't like this, this makes me cry, this makes me happy. Yeah. Not that there isn't, there aren't ambiguities there, there are, but you know that you can't reason with an infant. No. You begin to sense, okay, I am dealing with a creature of language, now they can be reasoned with, then what happens is the child has to accept the inevitability of 
a kind of subjective structuration based on like what is symbolically true. Yeah. And it, even if the justification doesn't always make sense or it's true because I say so, the authority of the law, what that means is that – and children oftentimes we think, oh, they're little greedy monsters. <laughs> you know, Many of us yeah. assume that they, they only know a kind of narcissistic enjoyment. Yeah. But at the same time, there are a lot of children who let's say introject the law almost to a frightening degree in the sense that they try to regulate other children's yes. behavior. They try to impose the law on other children. They try to prove something by maybe delaying gratification, for example. So all, that's all to say we get from the frustration of not having one's demands met to something like desire proper, which can, I think, only really emerge when the symbolic has been properly has been installed in the sense that now there is the law. Now the law is obscure, but theoretically, because language is supposed to make sense, theoretically, ideally, the law also makes sense. Yes. Can you access the heart of the law? No, you're not allowed to know the ultimate sense and meaning of the law. Yeah. There isn't any, but yeah. the child will once, let's say, truly at the level of castration operate as if the law does make sense. I don't know. Yeah. So, so here's the thing. Let's, let's, uh, cause that, that is a good thought. You're bringing up a lot of good points and especially you're bringing up some key terms. One of that is obviously law and language, but introjection, because here's the sleight of hand that Lacan points out from Fairbairn. Okay. So let's, let's bring this down to earth. Let's, jettison our uh you know psychoanalytic knowledge for uh for a moment it's like okay you have a baby the baby needs uh you know the mother's milk and needs to be uh changed when it when it uses the bathroom and so right here you have the mother or the father right but let's take this imaginary approach of like an imaginary person uh which is the mother uh taking care of these needs right so these this becomes the object relation for fairburn right and an object relationist loves to talk about how the symbolic breast or just the the breast is that object uh because it's nurturing it's warm it's connective so you get these affects built up um and so right here we get into this confusion well it's like okay how at what point does an object become introjected um, by the ego or by the baby who is going to develop their ego and what's called individuating from the mother, right? Because that can only happen if the baby is told no. Mommy, uh, mommy's, you know, breasts are hurting, you have to use the bottle, or mommy has to go to work or you're grown up now, you need to be playing with kids, you can't be demanding mommy's attention, all this stuff. But what is that but prohibitions, you know, in the Lacanian sense, the name of the father. Um, another thing is just that, well, you know, we're getting out of the level of the imaginary object of frustration and into the symbolic order of what is prohibited and what is enjoyable. And kids, you know, they they're in this weird relationship with language where it's like, okay, yeah, sometimes they don't understand metaphors, but they're not on the level of a psychotic where they have no grasp of language. In fact, they understand hypocrisy. And so sometimes they'll even play with the law and be like, mm. well, if I cry at night and mom comes into the room, well, then I just got mom's attention. Mm. So I could, you know, conclude that if I continue to cry, then mom will come in. And so right then we understand ways to get the object of satisfaction right is that start to make sense yeah like, absolutely. But, the point, but the point is is like well how is language or an object interjected if not by a prohibition and uh you know an instantiation of what is enjoyable and that's something that fairburn is not getting at um Fairburn, yeah and i yeah. think 
I, I just want to add, I think that no of the father proves to be the sort of fault line that separates the umwelt from the innenwelt in a sense from the outside, the inside, because language begins with a no. Yeah. And then that no is gradually made sense of, but also like you're saying, manipulated for all sorts of purposes because no is not easily definable at all. Think about yeah. it. You don't have a positive entity and then that positive entity is right. prohibited. You have the no first and then that positive entity emerges mm -hmm. as a consequence. Yeah. So I think these are like, well, well you'll say as a sleight of hand, but like, well, obviously there's a whole chat, uh, a seminar dedicated to object relations, but it's like, we could see the sort of blind alleys that, uh, this leads to or gets put into question, especially when they don't even take into account something that Lacan will go beyond, which is the intersubjective relationship, which Lacan literally dedicated a, a, a couple chapters to in this uh, seminar. You know, when we talk about the uh, the games, like the odds and evens, we talk about the purloin letter, like all this formulation of how, you know, the signifier functions and they don't even have an aspect because they're stuck on this imaginary ego with this primitive object and then it translates into other objects that are supposed to be healthy to create a healthy ego right and one of the things that he does see is interesting about Fairburn is uh he talks about something called the internal saboteur which happens from this sort of split between a good or bad object what is the eternal saboteur but it is the super ego right that pushes a sort of guilt or cruelty or punishment when uh, you do something wrong, when you uh, do something that is considered the bad object, or you you try to encounter the bad object, and the bad object must always be repressed. And he even says that for Fairburn, the superego does the repressing for the most part, or mitigates on this repression, which I never really found that it makes sense at all, you know? Yeah, and also this idea of a bad object, a good object, it's very ambiguous because this is just a, a hypothesis. I don't know if it's true, but it's kind of like what the child decides to interject, identify with as good. Yeah. It wouldn't make sense to an adult necessarily, so it's hard to say what's right. What's bad or good? I don't know if that point. Well, makes sense, but his, his presupposition is that in his re revision of Freud, he jettisons libido as pleasure seeking, which is something that is actually a misreading of Freud. Freud never says that is pleasure seeking. In fact, even like he'll talk about how he'll use the That's thing about love. About next. Yeah, yeah, and so friend's like, all right, no, libido is object seeking, and the ego is also object seeking. In fact, there's this relationship between libido and ego, but right. they're ultimately aimed at uh, a good, an object, an object relation. But I think the libido stays at an ego level when a bad object is interjected, and so it must be repressed. So it's the libido ego. Or the libidinal that is right. That's system. what I wanted to ask you about next. Yeah. Was like the libido ego versus the central ego. Yes, is what he so, calls it. So it's like the libido ego can be at variance with this central ego because they might not want the same thing. So what I understood from this approach was that the idea is to fuse the two back together so that yeah. the ego and the libido want the same object. And hopefully it's a good, happy, nice object with like a little yeah. button top that doesn't hurt anybody's feelings or offend it, anybody. Right. It's just like, we, we let out like, you know, all those things of like, you know, therapy out the back, uh, out the front door to bring it back into the, the back door. It's like total therapism of just integration, you know, solidified harmony of the ego but yeah, the, the libido ego is at odds because it, it is at, at one point like fixated on the bad object that can't be integrated. So another thing that he talks about with repression, he calls it the return of the bad object. So we could think of death drive or his notion of death drive, if we could call it that, uh, the encountering of bad objects. So it always kind of splits it out almost like in a way um, as a defense mechanism 
of how, you know, when you pull a lizard's tail and it pulls off. Hmm. So it's like, that's what the bad object is for the ego. The ego has to freaking take it out. And then like, it gets pushed back and repressed into the unconscious, but it's not the unconscious of Freud. It's not the unconscious of, of, of Lacan. Right. Right. It's just an unconscious part of the ego's uh, object relation that stays at the level of libido. Like to take it back to mother, good mother versus bad mother, this version, and it's like a almost parody or like the dumbed down version of the unconscious. I want to call it the subconscious because people love talking about the subconscious. Let's (laughs) talk about the 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 subconscious it's the rc cola to for real or coca-cola it's shasta (laughs) it's it's shasta yeah yeah it's like fago i was gonna i was gonna say it was gonna gonna be like coke zero but i like rc cola a lot better it's the rc cola version of the unconscious which is just (laughs) this other narrative going on behind the scenes kind of like when you're you learn about christopher columbus in history class about what a great guy he was obviously he wasn't and then you found out what all the ter- about all the terrible things he actually did and why he's semi-genocidal and you have these two dueling narratives that this was this is the official version and this is the real version and mm-hmm. it's kind of like that's what's going on with this idea of consciousness or just the conscious versus the subconscious right the issue is that with the good or bad mother it's kind of like okay you need to come to terms with what your idealized expectations are of what a mother should be right internalize these expectations by i don't know you know being exposed to different social influences or it doesn't even matter that much because they don't even get into the reasons why you would have these expectations so much as right oh well you have these formative experiences this is what most people think psychoanalysis is this is what most people think therapy is let's do the hard work of excavating these formative experiences which dictate your life and have implanted in you certain biases Here's the issue is that uh, psychoanalysis is not about idealizations that lurk behind the scenes. Psychoanalysis is about these the, the impossibility of the symbolic space of mother capital M. And once yeah. it's investigated, and this is where we get a kind of negation of the yeah. negation. And what that means is that, okay, all right, it's not my mother fine. It's neither mother. It's not mother. Just because it's not mother doesn't mean that let's say who it is, what it is, is the opposite of not mother. Mm -hmm. This is where, okay, it's going to get a little tongue twisted here, but it's neither not mother nor mother. Yeah. What the negation of the negation is. That's all to say just because something is not something else doesn't mean that two affirmations or two negations make an affirmation. It doesn't right. mean like in a sense, you know, it, it, it's contained in a strange way in the stupid cliche, two wrongs don't make a right. It's true. Two yeah. wrongs don't make the original affirmation. So what yeah. it means is it opens up a space that's there that one struggles with unconsciously, but it's not the space of false idealizations and coming to terms with reality as it is made up of certain objects. Because what that would mean is that, oh, we, well, we just have to accept mother, our mother, our actual mother, our actual father, the people yeah. in our lives as they are, flesh and blood creatures, warts and all with flaws and everything. No, like it's yeah. much more complicated than that. If it just meant coming to terms, like people do need to come to terms with certain idealizations. Right vacations but that can be done on its own the work of psychoanalysis goes much deeper than that right yeah and like you know with this whole thing because like one of the things it's like well what is what is the mother's function for an object relations bro well you know a mother's relation is for you know it it, what what it's a relation is to the 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 child is is by like the, the mother's biological functions as far as nurturing breastfeeding 
all that. And so there's this confusion between the imaginary and, you know, the register of the real for Lacan, but the register of the real is never put in question for them. If anything, if there's a real thing, it's the bio it's the biological body of 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 the mother insofar as the mother kid perform those functions in nurturing the child. And so it's like, well, uh, anything that has to do with a bad object then is due to some circumstances in which the mother cannot fulfill uh, the role of giving a good object relation. So therefore, there's the schism between the good and the bad object, right? But like, for us, like, and as you were just pointing out, like, there's just this radical negativity in or the space, which is from this radical negativity of uh, not mother and not not mother, right? That is on the level of uh, gaps, glitches, as uh, mm -hmm. Michael Downs was saying about how we should think about the symbolic order or just the unconscious, because it's like, well, what's what's absent and creates the gaps or the 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 lack of uh certain signifiers to be able to uh fill in well you know the fact that the symbolic order has these gaps because of the primordial uh imprinting which is the trauma or the repression right primary repression so because of that this is the reason why we have privileged signifiers because the privileged signifiers is not like oh this is your mother right here. Well, no, the, what the privileged signifier tries to do is compensate for the radical gap that is there mm -hmm. that, that we have trouble coping with. This is on the level of signification. This is the reason why speech is important or to get at uh, the unconscious and realize that the unconscious is structured like a language, that free association and the constant parapraxis lead us to the discourse that the subject is entrapped in because it's trying to cope with this radical split, not with a split yes. of subjects, but a split within its itself, with its own constitution. Right. I, and I think of this space as the space of libido because yeah. it's like, I, I like what he says here. This is earlier, a few lectures early, earlier, but I, I like this where he says, you know, you, you think of it as a unit of quantitative measurement, but as a quantity you don't know how to measure as nature, you don't know what you always assume to be there. Never fall prey to the temp temptation to yeah. uh, believe that in this Jungian life force, which is not what the libido is. It is a necessary conceptualization that bridges a gap, mm -hmm. is the gap. But yeah. also bridges the gap in a sense, and that's yeah. the uh, paradox of it. Mm -hmm. It's paradoxical. Yeah. Does the libido exist in the way that we say other things exist? No. This is what we've been talking about in what it, for what is sex. It's like the same thing with with sex. What what is you know last call it the onto epistemological short circuit. Yeah, which is just a, a fancy way of saying what connects thought and being but also disconnects them simultaneously yeah. and that's that's what we're dealing with in libido and i like this other i do like this definition i, I would want to use this in the future you know uh, a quantity which you don't know how to measure whose nature yeah. you don't know you always assume it to be there too yeah uh, in some sense and it's in the resonances when we're talking about also i'm thinking the this or build the child constructing their identity a primordial identity if you want to call it that out of images we aren't just talking about visual images either we're, we're talking about resonances they pick up on from voices what their mother mm -hmm. says those resonances are themselves libidinal resonances that right. almost seem to suggest something beyond what the words themselves later on retroactively right. signify right because one thing one thing that they the, the object relations don't understand and you you were just talking about resonances and and voices well the so because we have this understanding of language and we put an emphasis on language speech and the symbolic order well the object relations could just be one primitive thing that uh, a child could literally overcome and literally not be by the clutches of the bad mother, 
right? But at the same time, be haunted by a voice and nothing more from mm-hmm. the symbolic order, the big other, and how it manifests in imaginary scenarios and in institutions, in school, right? And corporations and in capitalism and all of these different things in commodities. And yet they all, you know, demand something that's within us more than us. That's more than us. That's that's the whole point of how the superego is probably just the voice and nothing more. Not this internalized saboteur, mm. right? That is trying to punish us, but ask that we bring out something, you know, from us to be our true selves, right? To to be authentic, to be whole, to be healthy, right? It's and at the same time, there can be this sort of castrating or um, you know, juridical superego of no, you can't do that. Obviously, we get this in like, you know, uh families that uh are raising their children like as, as evangelical Baptist fundamentalists, but kids are not so much this docile, passive child that just succumbs to it. Kids are rebellious, but yet the 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 haunting of language, the voice still resonates in other forms. This is why I was like, I was looking at yes, uh, the other day uh, during the what is sex conversation when I was trying to look at repression uh, to kind of clarify uh, like the murky waters between primary and secondary. But what I found interesting in the beginning of the seminar on the nucleus of repression is the Lacan's patient, the uh, the one who was raised is, uh, in a family of Islam, but did not oh, abide no, no. by the faith, right? Yeah. And one of the, the tenets of Islam is like, you get your hand chopped off if you steal. But what's interesting is like, this is kind of like similar to the prohibition of incest. What's well, like, you know, you're prohibited from having sex with your mother, right? Well, it's like, well, I never had that desire to begin with, but yet I'm told to not do something that I was not tempted to do. And so it's like, well, you're told you will get your hand cut off if you steal, but I've never had, I've never been a theft. I've never had the desire to, to, to steal, but yet it's something that is just so obscure and yet you could transgress. And at the same time, the form, not the content can still haunt you. And so how he was haunted in other ways from even disavowing Islam, the law was inverted in the misrecognized form and applied to his neurosis, right? You know, I love that. I love that because it's something that, you know, Michael Downs often reminds us of when we're talking about the injunction to enjoy it's not the injunction to just have a party yeah. and live hedonistically although some people interpret it as that it is i like how you quoted uh maladin dollar's book title there uh, a voice and nothing more it is a voice and nothing more which we are constantly trying to make sense of in one form right. or another. And we identify it with the voice of the law, but it's only because we misidentify what it's telling us to do that. It, well, it must be coming from on high. It must be a pronouncement from God. It isn't this, like you said, internal saboteur who just wants you to fail and, confuses a good object with a bad object because somewhere along the line we deviated from a path it's that it's not telling us anything it is sort of the way i understand it. i think there's a lot of controversy about the the, the role of the superego it's, it's still very hotly debated among lacanians and zizekians and none of this is very certain but right now at this point at least from what we've read i'm thinking of it as a kind of residue like lib- the libidinal residue right. of entering into language. And there's a, a phallic dimension to it in that, well, language needs its own backdrop, its own support in something for right. it to mean anything. And then, but the fact that it doesn't have that support comes through in this repetition of a voice. Right. Ultimately, incomprehensible but all the more powerful because of its incomprehensibility and sometimes we even allude to this dimension and saying well you're not allowed i do it because i said so you are so when a child questions the mother the father and again actually we bring in the you know postmodern father versus 
yeah authoritarian father but let's go back to just the authoritarian father who says you'll do it because i say so and this has to do with the secular islamist let's call him he's not an islamist but the uh the secular guy who was raised under islam you're 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 not like you'll do it because i say so implies you one you're going to be punished for disobedience but two you're going to be punished for questioning my authority and that kind of has to do with exactly the duality you're talking about the remember lacan says about the guy who has this pain in his hand because of the punishment of having your hand chopped off for theft not just that oh well it's not just like guilt it, it's not because he just trend well yes it is because he transgressed but part of the reason is because he even asked what the law meant in the first place yes exactly and that's the problem yeah that's yeah and that's it's it's so funny because it's like you know the, the 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 sort of like nostalgic conservative person is just like we need to go back to the good old days uh the the these liberal left people are ruining everything or like the, the more religious they get, it's just like, you know, we've strayed from the path of God. People are just radically hedonistic. And this is the decline of society because everybody just wants to have sex, you know, do drugs and you just like, you know, cause anarchy. But then you get on this left, uh, like this other side of the discourse where it's just like, liberate yourself, act now, be yourself. Even if they're not liberals, like even the most apolitical norm is just like, I just want to be myself. I don't hold to any party, you know, or I'm just trying to, you know, live authentically. I'm just trying to live life. Everybody has their own ideas, their own opinions, <laughs> and we can never seem to agree to anything. I'm just going to live life because that's it. That's it. And, you know, well, what is it? You only got one. Yeah, you only got one. So you just got to enjoy it, right? And so it's funny because it's like the the recent conversation with Chris Catrone and, um, you know, Adrian Johnston on Sublation Media. I really like how Doug Lane put like those like um, – uh intermission clips the commercial of burger king is so crazy because i'm thinking about the voice and nothing more if you look how happy the actors are they're buying the burger right and the uh the cashier person is just like you know enjoy and like but like how the voice is just so disembodied from the smile and the gestures it's just like we're trying so hard to enjoy and fit the role that the voice demands you know enjoy it you know have it your way right but it's just like you're forced to like know what my way is like what i'm forced to know what my way is and also forced to enjoy it and to choose it but i don't know what that is but the law is demanding for me to do that and even the person that's supposed to be giving to it giving it to me is probably un unsure as well and so yeah. like the decline is because we are trying so hard to enjoy and yet we can't seem to find what the law is encompassing as enjoyment right and so that's what kind of leads to like a lot of these like downfalls, whether it's in neurosis or, you know, we get transgression, et cetera. And not on the fact that people are just somehow getting pleasure, getting enjoyment. And the fact is like, it's just too much. It's like, well, we don't know what too much is. So we're not. <laughs> yeah. Let's, we need some air horns. I'm yeah. The soundboard. Cause <laughs> I would play them right now. Um, <laughs> You were given the onerous task of trying to explain what the fuck he's talking about here. With, oh yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and everything like that. If you so, want to, so we get into that. this. We get into this weird thing where we talk about speech now, why we want to speak, and the importance of language in the symbolic order. And so, if you followed us on the beginning of when we started seminar two, we talked about the you know, and so Lacan brings up something again about discourse and irrational numbers. Well, why the hell does that have to deal with anything? All right. So an example of the irrational number that he's talking about is the square root of two. That's considered an irrational number, right? What is the square root of two? I don't even know what it is when I put it on my calculator. It's just a long list of decimals, right? Um, but pretty much like, you know, the, the fact of a number being irrational is that it's contradictory. Uh, I looked this, this up on, on like Wikipedia and a couple other stuff. I'm no mathematician, but somebody who's a mathematician could just put that in there to correct me. But like, you know, you divide something and it just keeps going on and on and on and on and on in decimal form. And it's just contradictory, right? So what's important about the use of uh, square root of two for Lacan 
is in the Mino, right? The uh, slave boy is given a geometrical task by um, Socrates to show that he has knowledge, right? Knowledge for them is remembering in the Platonic sense, uh, remembering of a universal truth, a form. For Lacan and his uh, analogy of it, it's that there's a particular subject um, or a particular truth within the subject that is trying to be recalled. So for Socrates, he says to try to double the square, right? And the square is, I don't know how long I think or how big it is, but pretty much uh, the boy tries to square, uh, double the square. But instead of the square having to double and equal a length of eight and ends up equaling a length of 16, which is not, he in fact, you know, did more. So that's an error. So what does this mean, right? Well, for Lacan, we have something called intuitive knowledge. This is on the level of um, the imaginary. And this is like the errors that uh, the uh, object relationists, relationists, and other forms of therapy try to get on this intuition level of let me relate to you. Uh, you know the answer. Uh, it's within you type deal. But no, because even if you do that, you're bound to fall into error. The, Socrates kind of knew that the person was going to fall in error. But what does Socrates represent? He represents being a master that puts the person into question and kind of hystericize them. Um, and so the slave boy was told that he was wrong. And so what he does is he cuts back the corners a bit, and then he's able to um, uh, bring the uh, square to eight, right? And so pretty much, well, half of 16 is eight. So he just had to cut it in half, <clears throat> somehow the length in half, and then he was able to get the right answer, which is eight, which you know he had to do it a second time. So what this means is that well, what does what does Lacan say? Truth arises from error. Right. So it's from our error and our inability to get the answer right that we come at the truth um, over time. And so what needs to happen though is that you have somebody that could help you get the truth, the analyst. But this irrational number or this truth that is parallel to the irrational number is something that is not intuitive but has a symbolic value. You need to be able to tap into the symbolic order, to tap into language and the speech function to get at that truth, to get at the signifiers and signification. And that also counts at getting at the truth of the subject, the discourse of the subject that is split. We could also see the, 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 the subject, and this is kind of my hot take, the subject like an irrational number because it's something that can't be located, right? It, it, it can't be located in topography or topology. It's not the ego. It's not you. It's not my affects. It's not in the dream, but yet it appears a little too late. And once you realize it, it's already gone, right? Yeah. When we talk about yeah. the subject of enunciation versus the enunciated subject. And yet it still has this value in an irrational sense, like an irrational number does, because it's also contradictory. It's also split. And the more you divide it, the more it just becomes a less than nothing to use the Malarian Zizekian term. So that's what he's trying to get at from my understanding is that we have to understand that the imaginary economy and what the mistake of analysts do is they try to follow gut instincts and intuition and be like, well, you know the answer, I'm giving, you know, or like, let me relate to you. It's like, no, there's gonna be an error from language because they don't know what to say. You know, the only thing in analysis is to say what's on your mind as much as you can, but not say everything. And when you try to, you're bound to slip up. You're bound to make mistakes. You're bound to think that, oh, I've come to an insight, but it's wrong because the point of analysis is not insight, but the truth of the subject. The one divides into a less than two. Yeah. In a sense. Exactly. Yeah. That too. Which is where these glitches, as you were calling them before, appear in speech and slips of the tongue. Yeah. Even in misapplications of yeah. language. Exactly. Because Michael, it was Mikey that was helping me like understand with repression. Because it's like, well, when we look at the way, again, like who knows, maybe Lacanians do have a more 
uh, radical approach to repression compared to Freud, but it's like, it has nothing to do with like a repressed thought, like it's pushed down, but rather it just doesn't commute with everyday language because of how much there are gaps or glitches because there's not a complete symbolic order or a complete thing of language, right? And yet these glitches come up in like slips of the tongue, right? In Verneinung and all these all these incidences um, because of the way that there's just, uh, again, gaps in language. Right, which one might retort that right that's true but most of the time we don't slip up most of the time we aren't making these mistakes what do we talk what do we have to say about languages smooth functioning well here's the thing though the metaphor of the machine the machine that tries to account in a sense for its yeah. own subjectivity. Remember how Lacan characterized the machine as something defined by its malfunction, in a sense, which I take to mean, think about how, how do machines come in, into being? Well, a machine is invented to compensate for a shortcoming a flaw in another machine. So it's really these these flaws, mm -hmm. things going wrong that ultimately determine the function of the machine or the function of the subject in a sense. I don't know if that exactly yeah. relates to what yeah, you're yeah. talking about, but it's sort of I would when he may when he truncates the square, the slave boy from 16 <laughs> eight had to be 16 in the yeah. first place for him to arrive at that point of as he says space containing in itself its own intuitions it's a very hard thing to get yeah me to get my mind wrapped around but um you did a fabulous job there i don't know if i no, like i i agree right. with that too and like well one of the things it's like well the, the machine needs feedback to generate anything right and it does have a system and there is like maybe like as far as far as when we like talk about the machine and odds and evens like in the way that it's able to replicate the game there's like some anticipation involved but only in so far as that we kind of give it something to kind of create this order but like you know, like between that and like when we we got over the uh, psychoanalysis of AI uh, book from Alar, it's just like, well, the thing is, is like the paranoid conspiracy bro that thinks that like, oh, machines are going to take over the world. Like, no, like th this is like, like kind of like the fantasy of like showing how much like we lack because like if anything, like when in a robot or like a, an AI, any form of artificial intelligence tries to do or mirror things to like perfection of what uh humans are doing in the symbolic order it kind of makes a fool of itself and and like pretty much uh devalues the ideology by trying to be accurate i mean as far as like when you look at how self-checkout is like how it's supposed to take over the job of uh you know cashiers well, you still need somebody over there to look after it because the fact is like that shit goes wrong. It's like, you know, right. it, it it can't uh, properly scan bananas and or like, um, you know, it you you can't get your like you have to have somebody scan or, or type in the system to realize, oh, that you're over 21. So you could purchase alcohol, you know, right. Like all, these, all these things like it, it it's bound to error. I mean, like, I mean. I kind of had an example with that, but it feels like it's not no, kind of getting the point. I see what you're saying. Cause no, but it's also like if you think about the example of artificial intelligence, something that Millar points out is that no artificial technology, nothing that would hope to simulate human behavior would do so successfully without being stupid also okay. because yeah. stupidity but here's the thing about well stupidity is a very ambiguous word because it's like do we call someone stupid who makes a lot of mistakes not necessarily 
No, we call someone who's someone stupid when they revel in their own ignorance. Yeah. And that's part of being human. And what are the three passions for Lacan? Hate, love, and, and ignorance. Yeah. We our enjoyment consists in ignorance ignorance that the locus of our enjoyment is a kind of ignorance of our own symptom and artificial intelligence in that sense would also need to simulate our ignorance and enjoy thereby if it were to hope to be like us what Mm -hmm. we have to worry about is actually trying to in some sense imitate artificial intelligence Mm -hmm. and be like it in Mm -hmm. attributing to it this like hyper efficiency, which is kind of like just to uh, make an outlandish uh, parallel here between artificial intelligence and uh, this kind of conceptualization that Fairborn has of the ego or the more so the libido, which has its like proper object as if when we talk about like the hyper efficiency of something, it's as if, well, AI would have, an object proper to it. It has a task mm-hmm. to complete, but like as if that task is unambiguous in a sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if we went too far afield of what we were talking about here, but we have pretty much reached the end of yeah. the the what have you. Um did you have anything else to add about you no, should. I think, yeah, I think for the, well, like for the most part to kind of sum it up, it's just like, you know, we get into, again, like a sort of uh, blind alley with understanding the object relation. I mean, we talked about this in seminar one with Ballant and the theory of like general love and like, you know, a sort of relation as well. And like, there's no intersubjectivity, but like he goes so far as to like, uh, Fairburn goes so far as to like imply a sort of intersubjective relationship, like, but again, not coming close enough because he identifies it with the figure of the mother, but it's like, well, you know, you, you then relocate everything into an object, but then like, how does the object become interjected, right? Because I think like for him, uh, well, for Lacan, it's like, well, interjection of something, you know, re- requires that it, it be like either good or bad. But like you need another judgment, you need a sub another subject. He doesn't account for the intersubjective relationship in that sense, and so it's like you're kind of getting close. You kind of got a good like, even though your your uh, sort of schema of how the ego is is an imaginary economy. The logic is all there. It makes sense, but it falls short because you kind of do a sleight of hand and. Ultimately, you don't understand Freud because you throw out drives. You don't understand how libido translates into drives and how the theory develops. He even so far as discards death drive in that essay as well when you read it in the beginning. He's like, we have no need for the for the use of death drive. Which right? most yeah. wasn't that the popular thing to do yeah. at that yeah. time? Did yeah. It, like you know, most, most so-called object relations are, like within the Freudian tradition – they thought of death drive as a kind of eccentricity within his system that yeah just needed to be discarded because they were eager to systematize right Freud, whereas lacan is the thinker of drive yeah and rethinking of it because well one of the things that's that he's starting really, point yeah um, one of the yeah. things that he's really adamant about is looking at how freud was a savvy uh was a, like pretty much very savvy at language at understanding how language functions even if he didn't have a theory of structural linguistics it's like it's all there we just have to read learn how to read freud and realize that you know freud is using all these scientific terms like you know thermodynamics energy entropy not and not as like oh pseudoscience but as a sort of topography because he didn't have that uh structural linguistics thing it's like he fell so short because that was just a part of the science as far as the historical aspect but he was even trying to go beyond science because of the certain deadlocks that he realized things that were taken as given but not being critic criticized for like these presuppositions of instinct, which is something that they go back to. It's like, well, how is an object an instinct, right? 
how, how does the libido libido seek as its in instinct the ego and then the ego seek its instinct as the object that doesn't get put into question it's just like we just need to do this because we don't believe that the uh libido is pleasure seeking you know it, it, it makes me think of like how the way this functions it's like oh you have a problem with sexuality that's because the real problem is that it's a bad object relation when we talk about what is sex in the beginning it's just like sex is not the problem the problem is the fact that you have trouble adapting there are other circumstances that are being clouded by sex don't talk about sex this isn't therapy <laughs> that's what it right, makes me think. right yeah <laughs> it, it occurs to me how it, for its three essays on sexuality in their own way his concept of the libido there and this that is what his for not his first publication but a, what his breakout publication right isn't it I, that or i think so. no well i don't know cool well, because he had other stuff before that like i think uh psychopathology of everyday life was a little before that and then he had um the the dream uh theory of dreams came out in like 1890s but would wouldn't you say that three essays was his most revolutionary work i think the point. the dreams dreams were and then yeah maybe yeah i don't know well i guess i, I would just yeah his concept of the libido there prefigures what's going on in beyond the pleasure principle with exactly yeah i think he doesn't quite appreciate it yet but no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah, I think you're all right about that. You know, I mean, because there are decades in between those two. Because, like, even with the, the theory of dreams, the, the interpretation of dreams, it's like he's still on a scientific model of understanding the primary and secondary processes of excitation. He's only on that level. Uh, we we have an unfulfilled wish, but then we just have like, you know, scientific terminology that he's imminently in dialogue and critiquing with, or just like, oh, we could just use this term to mean like this. Uh, again, entropy excitation uh processes uh what else uh psychic apparatuses visit like all these things that have nothing to do with libido at first but then we could kind of imply like oh if we look at how libido functions this is what he's really talking about should we cult it there yeah all right peace y'all peace